so it's called The Song Poet. It'll be out April of 2016. It's for the suns that rise on the horizons we've yet to see, for my brothers and sisters, my sons and my daughters, for my father and Biya, who sings his lonely songs so that we may hear the trembling of the still fluttering heart. Gutia is, in the words of Ralph Ellison on the American Blues, an impulse to keep the painful details and episodes of a brutal experience alive in one's aching consciousness, to finger its jagged grain and to tr transcend it, not by the consolation of philosophy, but by squeezing from it a near tragic, near cosmic lyricism. As a form, the Blues and Gutia is an autobiographical chronicle of personal catastrophe expressed lyrically. Gutierrez songs can be duets, the voices of fathers and daughters coming together, different verses within the same song, stanzas in the same poem. This is from the beginning. Instead of chapters, I have tracks. So track one, birth of a song poet. Father, how does a song poet become? Father, how does an orphan boy find his song? Daughter, he didn't have very many people around to say beautiful things to him. Daughter, he used to go from the house of one neighbor to the next, collecting the beautiful things people had to say to each other. Daughter, by himself, he whispered the words again and again. One day the words escaped on a sigh, and a song was born. No one looked at a calendar or wrote down the date of my birth. I only know what my mother remembered and what my brothers have told me. My brothers say that I was born at the beginning of 1958, in the midst of the Laotian Civil War. In the bigger cities of Long Prabang, Sabanaket, and Vientiane, there were battles and debates between members of the Royal Lao government and coalition groups of communist revolutionaries. On the world stage, Laos had become a faraway place for the superpowers of the Cold War to test their might against each other. But in the high mountains of Pumbia, in the province of Sinquang, in the village of Pukhao, where I was born, the Hmong continued the life we knew. In 1958, according to my mother, the Hmong still believed that the young would outlive the old. Mothers and fathers continued to give birth to children. The living called out to the dead. Shoots of green rice were planted all on the sides of steep hills and fertile valleys. Harvests were had. In 1958, according to my mother, my father was thinning, but he continued his long shaman's tracks across the mountaintops to different villages to do healing ceremonies for those, for those who were sick weary of soul, or for those whose spirits were in need of a call to come home. In 1958, my father believed that there was still life in him. My brothers and my mother tell me that I was a harvest baby, an early birth in the new year. The fields had just been harvested, and the grain sheds were full to the top with rice and unshelled corn. The, temper the temperatures had dropped, and the white frost covered the greens of the mountain foliage in a thin layer each morning. The wind had grown cold and it swept through the village, cooling the uneven mountain terrain so that children with bare feet complained unceasingly about the cold when they traveled distances away from the house to pee or to poop. At each house, a fire burned around the clock. Mother sat in open doorways sewing French coins to Hmong embroidered shirts, pants, sashes, and skirts. Fathers checked in cows, pigs, and chickens to ensure that there would be enough meat for the ancestral feast and the streams of visitors. The young gathered around their elders and whispered wishes for new clothes to be made for the New Year celebrations, new cloth balls to be sewn so that they can toss them in the courtship rituals, new musical instruments to be crafted so that they can be played in village circles, and new Gutiaplang love songs to be tossed so that they can be sung at the festivities. The whole village was deep in preparations for the beginning of a new year, except my mother who could barely walk with the strength of my struggles inside of her. My mother's pregnancy had been difficult. Her daughters-in-law watched as she struggled to keep up with the younger women along the road to the garden and moved clumsily around the hard-packed floor of their communal home. By the time my mother had me, she had had nine children already. I would have been the tenth if the little girl with the pale skin and straight hair had not died. As it was, the adults knew that I would be her ninth and her final child. My mother was in her late forties by the time I came along. She could not sit for long in the open doorway preparing clothes for her children for the new year. Her back ached after just a few minutes. She could not bend down to stoke the fire close to the ground. 
She knelt on her knees around the fire, a short, stout woman, big belly before her, a bamboo fan in her hands, leaning awkwardly, fanning from the waist the flickering flames. Feet wide spread, she went through the days, a hand on her back, heaving great, long sighs with each step that she took. My mother was weak without energy during the long months that it took for me to grow within her belly. There were nights when she woke up shivering because she had kicked the harsh woolen blanket off in the sweat of a moment and then grown too weak and exhausted to pull it back up. For the last few months of her pregnancy, she woke up each morning in sweat as cold as a mountain stream. The chilly air traveled through the split bamboo walls. The hands of morning stretched its finger through vivid dreams of dense jungle land with the calls of wild creatures. In the gray, my mother made out the shallow breathing of my father beside her and saw how his body sank in with the exhalation of each breath. My father was a naturally thin man, but in old age he was little more than thin muscle clinging, clinging to bone. He slept with their youngest child, a two-year-old boy cuddled to his side, my brother who. My mother struggled off the bed as quietly as she could. Her wide feet on the smooth, cold earth she took in the cool mountain air, exhausted already by the thought of the journey to the bathroom. When my mother first felt me drop low in her belly, she knew I had made the decision to venture from the clouds into the world, and her exhaustion grew into a state of anxiousness. As a medicine woman, a healer, and a shaman, she had seen many old mothers who could not muster the energy to push their babies from their bodies. She had seen too many blue babies, colored like the monsoon sky, who never got to breathe the air of earth. My mother did not want this to happen to her youngest child. When she felt the familiar liquid rush down her legs and a pressure build low in her back, she told her daughters-in-law to stand aside. She crouched on her knees, legs widespread on a bamboo mat. She placed both hands on her thigh, looked straight ahead. My mother breathed the air of earth into her body and she pushed as hard as she could so that I would know the air that waited for me at the gate of life. She did not stop until she could feel my wet brown head against her fingers. When my loud cries split the quiet of the early morning, and called in the day with more gusto than the family's rooster, her daughters-in-law rushed in to close to help my mother. I was passed between different hands. My brother's wives crooned and they shushed me. They helped each other bathe me in the old plastic top by the light of the family's fire ring. The woman wrapped me up in a warm blanket and handed me to my mother. I'm almost two and I've learned how to walk slowly by myself. I'm a sturdy balancing act on the hard packed dirt floor. There is the outline of a dark man sitting by the light of the afternoon shadows. A fire burns in the center of the room, warming the cold air filtering through the doorway. The man's body is turned toward the flames of the fire pit. There is a bamboo basket of dried bark by his side. His hands are busy rolling out the long stretches of bark, twisting and turning it into rope. The doorway is on an even rectangle of light. Outside, there is the sound of children playing, laughing and talking, peals of delight and joy rising in rhythmic, predictable intervals. I want to join them. I make my way carefully to the open door. I put both my hands on the door's light frame, and I try and try to lift one leg high enough to cross the door's ledge to the other side. I try hard to raise the leg higher and higher, but it grows too heavy, and it falls down in a swoosh. I look at the man by the fire for help. I don't understand that my father has grown too weak with old age and the endless coughing that brings his shoulders high and shakes them. I do not know that it would be only months before my father would go to his bed and not get up again. I look at the man and then point to the open doorway where I can see who, my brother, playing with a spinning top. I will remember for the rest of my life the voice that carried his words to me, the only words I have directly from my father. Mithu, my little boy, come to your father. My son, come to me. Your father is making a rope for you to tie it on the little chicken. My little son, don't cry. This is from track two, A Fatherless Boyhood. The late afternoon sun glazed the mountain in its oily glow. The whole world was both too silent and too loud. The birds were chirping and chattering on the trees. Every few minutes, one or two of them cut a path through the cool air. Like butterflies, they chased each other, fluttering by. They landed first on one spot and then the next. The wing bugs were nowhere to be seen, taking a late afternoon hiatus before the nighttime duties commenced. Before I could conjure the words I wanted to hear, 
I realized I had to confront the ones I had heard. The sound of human voices played loud in my ears, like records' continuous tracks in my head. A sister-in-law was concerned that the rice rations were dangerously low. A big brother had tried to con control the frustration in his voice, but it had leaked. I'm doing everything I can. It is not enough. Are you saying we have too many mouths to feed? You want your children to eat corn mush? You will be lucky if there's even a harvest. When are the soldiers going to come? How long do you think before you have to fight? Tense silence. My head throbbed. A married brother had taken a trip to Longyang, the provincial headquarters of the war effort, and returned with candy for his brother, for his children. When the family had gathered by the fire after the evening meal and his children had proffered their hands, he had handed each of them a bag of candy. Of course, who and I had not proffered our hands. Instead, we had stood silently by and swallowed our spit as the girls chewed. The little girls were too young to think to share candy that was so hard to come by, particularly with uncles who would not ask. Who had whispered for me to pretend that I hadn't seen the candy? He had told me to look away and wash the wanting from my face. Who had tried once again to set an example for me to follow? I watched as my skinny brother lifted his head and turned his gaze toward the far corner of the house where the night slipped in through the split bamboo walls. I looked as my big brother followed the streams of moonlight on the black of our dirt floor with his quick gaze and then traveled with the moonbeams far beyond the walls toward the wide expanse of the night. I felt a need to escape, but my mind was not as strong as his, so I could not do so. I tried to trample at the injustice of wanting in my heart. My fight was on my face. I had not turned toward the shadows. Everybody could always see what was in my heart. On my who, I could not hide my yearning. In our room, my mother turned toward the wall. I slept beside who, underneath our blanket, my quiet brother whispered and whispered. He wouldn't let me sleep. He talked of the games he had played with the village children. First, it was jumping the rubber rope, and then it was tossing and catching little pebbles on the backs of their palms. And then it was throwing spinning tops into targets. He waited until our mother was asleep, her breathing regular, the form quiet. I knew he was approaching the real topic, keeping him up only after his muscles relaxed beside my own. His voice was hoarse when he told me of how embarrassing the experience was of can with the candy had been for all involved. I told Hu that I was sorry I could not follow the example he worked hard to set. My mother cleared her throat in her sleep. We grew quiet, closed our eyes, kicked a little against each other's leg in search of comfort, grew still, evened out our breathing, and tried to visit her and our father in our dreams. I ran away many times. Each time I ran away, I did not think about the coming of the night. On each of my runs, my only plan was always to find the tallest tree I could away from the village and to climb it. I thought I would stay there forever, somewhere between the sky and the earth. I sat on the tree's high limbs and I scanned the jagged rise of the mountains that surrounded my village, looked at the gentle curve of the valleys and searched for the place where my father was buried. All I knew was what I heard from my older brothers. Father is on a mountain that is the shape of, of an uneven triangle rising out of the high treetops. Up high on the tree, I repeated the words. I had gathered from friends and relatives words I heard my brother say to their children, words of appeal, of love, of courage, an assortment of words that traveled everywhere to come to the same place. Do not be afraid. Everything will be OK. I will not let anything hurt you. As the sun fell across the sky and colors lined the horizon, in uneven layers of pink, orange, lavender, and shades of blue, I watched the silhouette of the only place I had ever known enter into darkness. I heard the hoot of the night owls. My imagination grew sharp in the dark of the night, and jungle foliage grew thicker and thicker. I made out moving shapes. What had been clouds in the sky, puffs of white that had shielded the tops of the highest mountain peaks, floated down and hovered over the ground in white fog. I curled my legs up on the tree limb and felt the cool dampness of the mountain air settled into the smooth bark, felt the travel of cold through the thin cotton of my pants. My shirt was little armor against the evening wind. I recall the stories of the village elders, of torch souls wandering the night in lines of fire seeking reparations for the living. For the safety, from the safety of the storytellers met, it had been fun, pretending that the fireflies hovering in the nearby brush were the tortured souls alight with anger. In the dark of my tree limb, 
I could not trust that the blink of light I saw belonged to fireflies. My courage wavered, and I realized how I had acted childishly in my frustration. Running away was not the answer, only the distance I needed to fortify my heart for a father I could not locate in the world. Each time I ran away from home, I walked home along the same path I had taken. I went along the, list, the long list of things that my mother did for each of us every day. I started thinking about all my older brothers and sisters. Nia attended a huge field so that he could share his harvest with his mother and his little brothers. Ju had become a teacher so that he could share his government salary with everyone in the family. Sai got up before dawn each day and crawled into bed at first dusk each night so that he could rise early again in the morning and be the first to attend to the communal work of the village. Bali worked hard at raising healthy chickens, dogs, pigs, and cows so that the family could have meat at each New Year feast. Ang carried books in his hands all the time and wrote notes of politics and humor in his books so that he could be an example of education for who and me to follow. Ya yeah, cooked and cleaned without complaint. God did our laundry and helped with the house, helped with the house um, and the long and her long list of complaints each day against each one of us but never stopped her busy hands and feet from working, even as her, work, her mouth worked against us. They all did so much. What did I do? B was too sensitive. B told himself that the concern over the rice was not about him, but the war. B told himself that the brother who had bought candy for his children was simply being a good father. It was not his intentions to make anyone sad. All his brothers were acting as best they knew how. The sadness was because he didn't have a father, nothing less and nothing more. I told myself I needed to expand my heart and thicken my skin and become more of what my family needed me to be, more like who, even without his school smarts or big round eyes. I ran away many times because I could not carry the weight of words spoken. I could not use my mind to escape from the actions around me. There were words I yearned to hear and there was no one to say them. Each time I ran away, I found, I found myself stumbling back home, baffled by my own lack of competence. My mother never asked why I ran away. Each time I said, and she agreed. I had gone to play by myself because I was a loner and had strayed too far. It had taken me too long, much longer to get home than was good for me. My little feet could not beat the descent of a great sun. Of course, I was young and I forgot, even after the other times she had admon admonished me and told me to remember. My mother was always only too happy that I had found my way home again. She moved close to me, surrounded me with a scent of menthol oil and dry herbs. A woman of strong, steady public words, my mother did not offer many endearments, but each time I returned home, I made out the beating of her frantic heart. The only person who knew that my late return was not an innocent mistake was who? Each time I saw it in his eyes, a blend of hopelessness, of disappointment, of regret, of love, who laid very straight in the bamboo platform bed he shared with me. He pulled the rough blankets up to our necks. Who folded his arms to pillow his head? He stared up at the thatch roof ceiling. His head did not turn, his eyes did not close. He took deep breaths. His bony chest rose high. Slowly, a sleep was coming to me. One of his hands unfolded from the other, and he reached out quietly to hold my smaller, meatier hand in his own. He gave a tiny squeeze. In the force of those thin fingers, I felt I was not alone. I understood that we inhabited the sadness together. I realized how, if I had not returned, who would truly be alone? That's when I cried. For my own thoughtlessness and our endless yearning, I didn't dare make a noise. My body jerked in small hiccuping motions, and the hot liquid of my tears slipped out of, the, out of my eyes and down either side of my face. The tears that I had held back by the firelight in the track away from our village, up high in the tree, became a small, salty stream of hurt unfurling. Through the tears, I could see my mother's back turned to the wall. In the dark, it seemed her body jerked in little motions, similar to my own. I was 12 years old when I began singing Mong Song poetry. My body was changing. More and more girls were noticing me in the village. My mind was changing, too. I understood that school was not my arena, but that I could find other pathways into manhood. The world we lived in was changing. Each day I grew more and more certain that my future would rest at the point of a gun, not a pen or a garden hoe. The drums of the dead battled with the cries of widows and orphans in our village. The only way I could meet their pain was to take it inside of me. 
melted into my flesh and feel the pull of the Hmong blood pulse through my veins, fill my heart and overflow. When I began singing song poetry, I discovered I could share our stories of hurt and sorrow, of missing and despair, of anger and betrayal, conscious and unconscious, intentional and not, my silent sensitivities with those around me. In my songs, my brothers and sisters, family and friends, felt the fall of their own hot tears come down their cheeks. My songs allowed me and those around me to feel that longing for those words that were impossible to live up to, but unforgettable to hear. Do not be afraid. Everything will be okay. I will not let anything hurt you. Thank you so much.